Joker had to be one of the most talked about and argued about films of 2019, and while I'm sure there's plenty we can still argue about regarding it, one thing I bet we can all agree on is that the Joker character was great long before the movie Joker came out. One characteristic that unites the best portrayals of the Joker is that his background is never really delved into during them. This was particularly true in The Dark Knight, where on two separate occasions, the Joker asks, You wanna know how I got these scars? You wanna know how I got them? Then answers himself with stories that contradict. So I had a wife. My father. The movie was making it very clear that we weren't going to learn anything here about the Joker's past. By seemingly denying us an answer to these two questions, Christopher Nolan, Jonathan Nolan, and David S. Goyer were not challenging us to answer those questions for ourselves. They were actually giving us the answers to both. According to them, the true identity of the Joker is, he's the Joker, and the real reason he's evil is because he's evil. As Alfred put it, Some men just want to watch the world burn. The Joker's motivations do not stem from a rotten childhood, the loss of a job, or a bad case of PTSD, nor do they stem from him simply being crazy. You're crazy. I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Instead, the Joker at his best is evil for no other reason than evil exists and there's nothing you can do about it. You can fight it, you might occasionally defeat it, but you can never eradicate it. Now before you tell me these aren't the same characters, and it's not the same movie, and it's not the same cinematic universe, so it's not fair to compare them, don't bother. Though I absolutely regard Joker as an unnecessary origin story, I don't actually think that was the film's biggest problem, nor do I think it was doomed to be bad because of it. The mere fact that there are are good origin stories out there means Joker could have been one as well, but it wasn't. So what went wrong? To start with, we may as well look at the answers that writer-director Todd Phillips and co-writer Scott Silver gave to these two questions that Christopher Nolan and company steadfastly refused to answer. According to Phillips and Silver, the Joker's true identity is Arthur Fleck, a 40-something-year-old man who lives with his mother, works as a clown, and aspires to be a comedian. As to why Arthur turns into the evil Joker, among the myriad reasons we're given are that he has a severe mental disorder, he gets fired from his job as a clown, he gets beaten up by complete strangers twice, he goes off his medication, and he learns his mother is nuts. While there's nothing inherently wrong with these answers, by themselves they don't make Arthur a compelling character because they're things he has no control over. Characters aren't interesting just because bad things happen to them, they're interesting because of what they do in response. These factors may cause us to feel bad for Arthur, but sympathy is nowhere near as interesting as empathy. Whereas sympathy is merely superficial, empathy allows you to see yourself in someone else. An immediate problem with Arthur is he's not very empathetic. Now to be clear, that's usually the case with the Joker, but the Joker is also usually the villain whom you don't have to identify with. It's the hero that you relate to. In Joker, however, Arthur is the hero, or the anti-hero. Whatever you want to call him, he's the protagonist of the story, meaning you should be able to identify with him. But while this early scene of Arthur having a laughing fit certainly allows Joaquin Phoenix to flex his acting skills, it's kind of impossible to relate to. And that didn't have to be the case. You don't have to have the same problem problems a character has in order to empathize with them, you just have to understand what they're going through, why they're going through it, and how it affects them. Factors that are best delivered with subtlety. For instance, Todd Phillips could have gradually introduced us to Arthur's mental state by first showing some minor causal events, then showing Arthur's unique stress response. That way we'd start to anticipate them. We'd think, uh-oh, Arthur's in a stressful situation, he's gonna start laughing uncontrollably. But instead, Phillips elected to just drop us in the middle of this laughing fit without first showing us what caused it. Is Arthur laughing because he got beaten up earlier? Is this even the same day? The laughing fits he goes on to have occur when he's out in public and dealing with strangers, but here he's talking to someone he knows in a place he's been to before. So why is he laughing? My best guess is this has nothing to do with narrative logic, and it's here simply because it looks disturbing and it allows Joaquin Phoenix to act crazy, a combination that Todd Phillips prioritized over pretty much everything else. And it's not just this scene that that's devoid of subtlety, the whole movie is, from Arthur getting beaten up by a group of children in the very first scene, to Arthur bathing his naked mother for some reason, to Arthur not understanding when he's supposed to laugh. <laughs> 
something I'll address once I have time. To Arthur getting beaten up by a group of complete strangers for no reason again. To Arthur sticking his fingers in a child's mouth to make him smile. To Arthur's stand-up routine going predictably awful. To Arthur giving this angry speech at the film's climax to justify his terrible actions right before he points a gun at someone he barely knows and shoots him in the face. Instead of subtlety, we get lots and lots of redundancy. Over and over, we watch Arthur live a sad, disturbing, and violent life, and over and over, we watch him do sad, disturbing, and violent things, the majority of which are not compelling to watch because Arthur's story is so poorly told. Not only is it repetitive, redundant, devoid of subtlety, and lacking empathy, it also often lacks the basic elements that make a story a story. To show you what I mean, consider this subplot from Batman Begins. One of the ways that movie built upon the backstory that Bruce Wayne has always had was to grant the man who killed Bruce's parents early parole in return for him testifying against Gotham's organized crime. He learned things and he will testify in exchange for early parole. Rachel, this man killed my parents. Unable to stand the thought of this man going free, Bruce acquires a gun with the intention of killing him. But on the day the man is released, someone intervenes at the last second to do what Bruce was planning to do himself. This simple and short subplot, all by itself, tells a complete story. It has a character who wants something, an obstacle in his way, an attempt to overcome that obstacle, and a result. Compare that to pretty much any story thread from Joker, and something is likely missing. For instance, Arthur is beaten up while performing as a clown, so fellow clown Randall gives him a gun. Arthur drops the gun on the job, which leads to him getting fired. Then on his way home, he's beaten up again, but since he has the gun on him, he kills his attackers, which the press dubs the clown killings. Randall later goes to Arthur's apartment to discuss the clown killings, and Arthur murders him. Then he goes on a talk show, confesses to the clown killings, and shoots the host. So what does the subplot from Batman Begins have that the plot from Joker doesn't? Well, there's probably lots of things, but the two factors I want to mention are that with Bruce, we know what he wants, and we know what stands in his way. With Arthur, we don't really know either. He didn't want this gun in the first place, and once he has it, he doesn't know what to do with it. With no real desire and no real obstacle standing in the way of that desire, the story feels aimless. Now that does change during the brief aftermath of this second random attack when we know Arthur's intentions towards his first real victim. And since we haven't seen Arthur hurt anyone other than himself, we're not quite sure what he's going to do. But once this pursuit is over, the story goes back to feeling aimless because we go back to not knowing what Arthur wants. Does he want to kill Randall at this point? They do have this minor confrontation. Why don't you ask Randall about it? It was his gun. Stop talking out of your ass, Art. <laughs> But then Randall completely disappears from the story. If he hadn't needlessly shown up at Arthur's apartment just as Arthur was leaving, presumably for the last time, then Arthur almost certainly would not have gone after him. As to why he does go to Arthur's apartment, he implies it's because he's worried Arthur is going to implicate him to the police. Now they're looking for me, and I just want to know what you said. Make sure our stories line up. That makes no sense. What could Arthur possibly tell the police that Randall couldn't successfully deny? Nothing. That Randall goes to Arthur's apartment for this nonsense reason after Arthur tells everyone that Randall got him fired does not seem like something a rational person would do. It doesn't even seem like something a stupid person would do. It seems like something Todd Phillips shoehorned into his movie because he wanted to put as much disturbing imagery on screen as he possibly could. And while this definitely is disturbing, it's not narratively cathartic because Randall is not an effective antagonist. The only time he actually prevents Arthur from getting what he wants is when he lies about the gun. Besides, Randall told me you tried to buy a 38 off him last week. However, Randall's not even on screen here, which means he lied about the gun before this phone call took place, which means Arthur's fate was sealed before this conversation took place. You're fired! This foregone conclusion of a scene where the antagonist isn't even present is not exciting. Unfortunately for the movie, the lack of an effective antagonist antagonist does not end with Randall. For instance, the most antagonistic thing that Thomas Wayne does is he's not Arthur's father. Your mother adopted you while she was working for us. That's not true. At least Randall lying about the gun off screen took place within the timeline of the story and involved Randall doing something. With Arthur's mother, we have a similar problem. Though this letter of hers gets Arthur's hopes up that Thomas Wayne is his father and her being delusional dashes those hopes, again, nobody has to do anything to prevent Thomas Wayne from being Arthur's father. He 
just isn't. Arthur's mother couldn't change that if she wanted to, which she does. She wants Arthur to get what he wants, which is the opposite of what the antagonist should want. Even worse, she keeps her delusion that Thomas Wayne is Arthur's father a secret for no reason, which means Arthur's letdown has almost no buildup. That Arthur then kills her for something she had no real control over feels about as satisfying as Arthur killing Randall, which is to say, not very. It just feels like more violence for the sake of violence. Speaking of which, the most antagonistic thing Murray does is make fun of Arthur's stand-up act. Well, no one's laughing now. You can say that again, pal. This really offends Arthur for reasons I find inconsistent. Arthur's previous job, which he was quite dedicated to, I love this job, involved him acting like a fool for the express purpose of getting people to laugh at him. If anything, this should make him happy. Also, if Arthur is so mentally incompetent that he doesn't understand when he's supposed to laugh at a joke, how does he even know he's being made fun of? How does he draw the distinction between being laughed at and laughed with. Anyway, Murray invites Arthur on his show, and Arthur confesses to the clown killings, then shoots Murray, even though Murray has nothing to do with the clown killings or with the societal ills that Arthur claims led him to commit them. Murray barely has anything to do with the story at all, which makes his death as unsatisfying as Randall's and Arthur's mother's. And like these two, Murray is defenseless here. There's nothing preventing Arthur from getting what he wants. Go back to this scene with Bruce, the thing that makes it so captivating is Bruce knows what he wants is wrong. The obstacle in his way is huge. There's a good chance he wouldn't have been able to go through with this even if he wasn't interrupted. Arthur, however, has no moral compass to overcome. So unlike Bruce, he can't effectively serve as his own antagonist. There's nothing within Arthur preventing him from becoming Joker. If anything, it's kind of incredible that he didn't turn into Joker way sooner. Lastly, we have Arthur's clumsy attempt to blame the clown killings on society. I killed those guys because they were awful. Everybody is awful these days. Everybody just yells and screams at each other. Nobody's civil anymore. Nobody thinks what it's like to be the other guy. If it was me dying on the sidewalk, you'd walk right over me. I pass you every day and you don't notice me. So Arthur is making a pretty big logical leap here. He equates the guys he killed with society by saying both groups are awful. Then he defines awful with this list of grievances. And since being awful is the uniting factor between the two, he's basically implying that this list is why he committed the clown killings. But it isn't. He killed these guys because they violently attacked him. This list had nothing to do with it. If all these guys did was yell at Arthur, act uncivil, fail to empathize with him, and ignore his plight, he would not have reacted this way. Arthur's speech fails to make society the antagonist of the story. Okay, we got a lot of problems to contend with. A poorly structured story that's heavily redundant, devoid of subtlety, with a non-empathetic protagonist who has no clear goals and few if any obstacles in his way. So which of these problems is the biggest? Which one, if addressed, would go the farthest towards fixing the story as a whole? Well, in order to fix the story's redundancy, you pretty much have to give it a better structure. And in order to make Arthur more empathetic, you pretty much have to give him some clear goals, throw some obstacles in his way, and preferably do so with subtlety. So it's kind Kind of a tie between these two. Yet as problematic as these issues are, they're still symptomatic of an even larger one, which was there from the very beginning. And have you thought more about why you were locked up? Arthur is crazy before the story even starts. Joker is essentially a two-hour movie about someone who's already crazy going a tiny bit crazier. That's the problem. That's why Arthur is so difficult to relate to. We don't watch him go crazy because he already is. That's also why the story is so redundant. It has almost no ground to cover. That's why these revelations that Arthur was hallucinating his relationship with Sophie or that he was abused as a child don't feel particularly momentous. It's hard to make Arthur's insanity a plot twist if we already know he's crazy. To fix this, Arthur needs to start off a bit more sane. One way Phillips and Silver could have achieved that would be to ditch the whole clown thing and go with the comedian angle, if Arthur was a bit better at it than this. <laughs> then his dream of performing on The Murray Show would be transformed from something that could only happen out of dumb luck Murray asked if I would reach out to you to see if you would come on as his guest. into a difficult yet attainable goal. That same change could also improve Randall as a character. If he was a rival comedian, then instead of giving Arthur this unwanted gun for completely ambiguous reasons, he could sabotage one of Arthur's performances because he's jealous of Arthur's growing success. That would make Arthur the butt of a joke he really doesn't like. As for Murray and Thomas Wayne, since 
either matter that much to the story by themselves, why not combine them into the same character and have Murray be the person that Arthur's mother used to work for and thinks is Arthur's father? If she didn't needlessly keep that a secret from Arthur, then the person whose show Arthur aspires to be on would also be his potential father. That would give these two a much stronger connection than Arthur simply watching Murray's show. I could keep going, but I think I'll stop there. While I think changes like this could have made Joker a better movie, that movie would still feel like the story of Arthur Fleck. Again, I don't regard the Joker as a riddle to be solved. I don't think these questions have better answers than the Joker is the Joker and he's evil because he's evil. Answers that fall short of that are bound to feel inadequate and unnecessary. To even try to come up with them feels like something of a fool's errand. Anyway, that's my take on the real problem with Joker and how to fix it, sort of.